Hello and welcome to Neighborhood Nature. My name is Lisa and I'm a librarian at St. Albert Public Library and my co-host is Tana who is a U of A student in animal biology. And this week we have a special Neighborhood Nature. We're welcoming a special guest, Tabea Trotman, who is a botanist. Thank you for being on our show, Tabea. Thank you for having me. Hello. So Tabea is going to be talking today about fungi, wildflowers, lichen and moss. And without further ado, let's start with our fungi. Okay, so um, we have some green bodies that you're looking at right now. Um, and green bodies are what you commonly call the mushroom of a fungus. Um, it's what they use to reproduce. They set out spores, um, and then the rest of the mushroom lives as kind of a mat of string-like cells called hyphae in the soil. Um, there's lots of different kinds of fruiting bodies. We saw some basidiomycetes kind of fruiting bodies with gills earlier. Um, and then there's puff balls that send out little puffs of spores, um, or polypores, which are a different kind of fungus. Um, they have little holes on the bottom and they tend to grow on the sides of trees. Uh, they're also called conchs. Um, they're really commonly found on birch trees. Um, and here we can see some more puff balls. They um, are a special kind of fungus that has the spore producing cells on the inside of the ball. So it's kind of protected, and then when they're ready to release their spores, they crack open, and then if you step on them, it makes that little cloud, which is all the spores going everywhere. I'm guessing, Tabea, that these are all poisonous mushrooms? Mm, mushrooms are, well, some of them can be very poisonous. Um, they have a really large suite of enzymes and chemicals that they use to digest or communicate or defend. Um, so some of them can be really, really deadly. So don't eat a mushroom if you don't know what it is. <laughs> um, some of them are edible, obviously, um, but I'd always, always recommend that you take an experienced um, psychologist or like sort of field ID person along with you uh, if you're going to harvest wild mushrooms Just because you don't want to risk it. <laughs> yeah, oh, definitely. You definitely don't want to risk it. And I'm noticing this year, I don't know if it's because of all the rain, there seems to be so many mushrooms this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, some really uh, fever wet conditions, which is why it's there's like a really high diversity of them in the tropics and um, in like the BC rainforest, for example. So with all the rain that we saw last year and this year, all the mycologists who are people who study mushrooms or fungi are going just crazy because um, everything's fruiting. It's really cool to see, um, especially in the kind of fall. You can take a walk through the forest and see like a huge amount of diversity. Um, yeah, it's really exciting. That's very cool. Where in St. Albert, if somebody wants to see some mushrooms, where would they go in St. Albert? Um, so you can head to River Lot 56 or the Cone Park. Um, different fungi, most of them will be, not most, but you'll see a lot of diversity kind of in forested areas because a lot of times they grow um, in association or a symbiotic relationship with trees. Um, and so Forested areas, you can look on the soil and um, kind of clear away any of the, the upper level kind of decomposing matter. Um, you'll find lots of little little fruiting bodies. Um, some of them like to grow on decomposing logs. Um, and so you can kind of, if you see a decomposing log, kind of take a closer look because there's lots of different stuff that grows on there. Um, some fungi feed on uh, old wood. They're called uh, saprophytic or saprotrophs, I think. Um, and they're, yeah, they're a really interesting suite of fungi as well. And then some of them, like the conchs, are uh, almost a parasitic type of fungus, which will grow on the living tree. There's a common one that grows on birch trees, and it will kill the tree, and then it'll mm. feed on the decomposing wood. So if you have one of those on your birch tree, you should definitely remove it. Uh, yeah, you can remove the fruiting body, um, but it won't remove the fungus because the majority of the fungus will be living inside the tree itself. Um, so if you have it on your tree, it's, it's kind of just a, a waiting matter before the tree dies, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it's not terribly common on, on domestic birch trees. There's such yeah. a diversity of mushrooms. Like I knew there were lots, but I had no idea there were so many. There's that pink one mm -hmm. in the video here that you can see and it has the pink stem and that one, Hannah, you found that one. And that one you said, mentioned to us earlier that it was rare? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily rare. Um, I just, um, I, when I looked at it, I thought that it was a Rustula, which is a common genus of um, fungus uh, that you can see a lot. It has that pink cap, but because it had the pink stalk or stipe, um, 
that was really different, and I hadn't seen it before. It was really cool. Um, rarity is kind of hard to measure for fungi because um, usually all you're seeing is the fruiting body, and so a mushroom or a fungus could be quite common, but it doesn't reproduce very often, and so we just don't see it very often, and we think that it's rare. Um, yeah. So if I found a mushroom and I want to know what kind it was, how would you go about finding out what kind it is? Um, so ID mushrooms is um, really fun and kind of challenging. Um, there's a couple of common uh, books that you can use, like um, field guides. Um, and usually when you look, uh, the kind of details that you're looking for to ID a mushroom are um, what type of gills it has. So if you look underneath the cap, um, does it have gills or does it have pores, um, like a polypore would? Um, is it kind of um, brittle? Like, does it have a chalky texture or is it quite squishy and flexible? Um, uh, how are the gills attached to the stalk? Um, sometimes they have like a veil covering the gill. Um, and then sometimes the caps are different shapes, so it'll be um, like flaring upwards or kind of curving like a bowl. Um, you can also smell the mushroom, that's a big part <laughs> of mushroom ID. Um, I personally am not well trained in smelling the difference between different mushrooms, but some people, yeah, they're very good at describing that. Um, and you can also, if you take the stalk off and then put your mushroom gill side down on a piece of paper, and leave it for a couple hours. You can take it off and have what's called the spore print. And so all the spores will fall out onto the page. And the color of the spore print is also an indicator of um, what kind of mushroom it might be. So if you have a field guide um, and you're flipping through, you can kind of start by looking for pictures that are similar and then reading descriptions and testing all those traits to see if it's, um, yeah, what you think it is. It sounds tricky. Now I know for some of the other things that we've talked about in Neighborhood Nature, like uh, plants and birds, there's apps out there that you can use to identify. Is there anything like that for mushrooms? Um, for mushrooms, there's an app called iNaturalist. Um, I don't know if you guys have talked about it. We have it recommended previously. that one before, yes, in a neighborhood nature, yeah. yes. Yeah, it, well, you can also use it for fungi and um, biocytes like mosses and lichens. Um, because it's much more of a niche community, there's not as many resources available usually. Um, but the nice thing about iNaturalist is that you can upload it, label it as a fun guy, and then if uh, another professional or someone else who knows a bit more than you sees it, then they can help you ID it further down, um, which is really helpful, especially when you're just starting out. That's great. Well, now I think we're going to move on to talking about wildflowers.